Well met everyone. Today's video is a spotlight on journey of the spirit walker. This is the third chapter of the Aaron and Chronicles. This book was sent to me by my good buddy, Nicholas. So what do we have here? This is the third chapter of the Aaron Chronicles. I didn't know anything or do anything with the first one. I believe it has to do with the stars, the cosmos, things of that nature. I did do a spotlight and a talk through of the previous one, which was Journey of the God Slayer, which I believe on DM's Guild is already a platinum seller. So if that is in any indication as to the, the fit and finish and level of quality that you might get in this new product, that's saying something. I mean, this thing is already a best copper seller, and I believe it's only been out maybe about a week. You can find this now. I'll put a link in the description for $24.95. This was, however, sent to me, so I did not have to pay for this content, but I will try and be as objective as possible and simply talk through what is here. And my goal with this is to highlight just that, what's here, and hopefully take you off the fence and help you make a little bit more of an informed decision as to whether or not this might be something that's a good fit for you and your gaming group. Let's use the little snippet that's here in the DMs Guild interface before you purchase it of kind of talking through very br very briefly bullet point format what you might find within this is the third chapter of the Aaron chronicles the journey of the spirit walker is a complete compendium of spiritual entities and the mysterious powers of animism for those who dare to invoke them through its pages you will discover the various kinds of spirits that inhabit enchanted forests haunted ruins and other mystical realms beyond the veil you will also learn the ways of summoning such entities, whether to become a host to their supernatural powers or seal them away through occult rituals. In this book, you will find an introduction to animism and the new spirit subtype, as well as how one may contact these mysterious creatures. You'll find numerous summoning rituals, seances, and talismans unique to each spirit's kind and personality. There's a unique system of spiritual attunement that allows a character to become a host to a spiritual entity and share in its host powers. There's 11 primal spirits, incarnations of nature's will, that are introduced with their own lore, music ambiance, scaling stat blocks, as well as 55 host powers to share with their allies. 13 ancestral spirits, with according stat blocks, host powers, and so on. Eight Aetherian spirits and five outsider spirits. There are four types of spirits, primal, ancestral, Aetherian, and outsider. There is also a new intricate system for the creation of magic items through spiritual binding, allowing you to seal the essence of the spirits into fetishes and take advantage of their powers. 25 new magic items inspired by the worlds of the spirits, 22 new spells, 13 new character subclasses tailored to engage each class with the essence of the spirit world. And then there's 150 bookmark pages. This is in really cool PDF format full of captivating, captivating lore and original artwork to inspire you. Whether you already own Journey of the God Slayer or you watched my spotlight on it, you will know the quality of artwork that was in that. And this definitely follows suit. So let's jump into what is here. As I said, once again, I did not have to pay for this. It was sent to me by my good buddy. He let me know that this was coming out. Hey, I'm going to be releasing. We are going to be releasing Journey of the Spirit Walker. If you are able to, I'd love for you to do a spotlight review on it. And that is what I'm doing here. So thank you so much for sending this to me. Blessed always. Appreciative. We will talk more in the future. Do some more business together. Journey of the Spirit Walker. As a DMs Guild product, all the normal attributions are in place here with the logo down there at the bottom you're going to immediately start to get a grasp for not just the style and theme of the artwork, but the quality of it. The Aaron Chronicles, written by the following three. You have a really cool credits page, giving proper attribution to everyone. I mean, this shows you the amount of people that were involved and in what pieces of artwork. So there's a lot of art. A table of contents, of course. I mean, look at this alone. You know I'm a big sucker for a picture is worth a thousand words. If you're ever stuck... You're fishing for a little bit of that creative fuel. Something like this sparks. Even if I wasn't going to be entertaining some sort of spiritualism and animism in my world, this picture gets the wheels turning. It makes me now consider, hey, 
I think I want to do a little more with spirits, right? Because how many times, whether it's inspired by Curse of Strahd or, you know, the ghostly sort of things, you're going into a haunted tomb. There is an ancient home where all this long line of wizards have lived and they've passed on their old forbidden magic from one wizard to the next. And there may be some really interesting things within that home, this manor. But there's rumors of a ghost. As it stands, where do we sort of go for that sort of content? Well, you generally will flip through the monster manual, pull out a ghost and say, here it is, right? But then your players are going to start asking all kinds of questions. Can we interact with this ghost in more ways than just fighting it? What if it's beyond us? Can this thing be a sort of recurring NPC, someone, something we can talk to, a quest giver, provide us with adventure hooks, give us information? This book and that's what I really love about their the sort of the Aaron Chronicles where you can tell there's just a level of detail, knowledge, and passion as it was with Journey of the God Slayer of what happens when you want to go and take down the gods. You know, like these are the sort of pieces of content on DMs Guild that answer so many questions for DMs and players alike. And in this regard, it's I want to get a little more into the spiritualism of things and animism. I mean, that's a very Wikipedia it. It is an integral part of myth, mythology, religion, life, culture of so many indigenous peoples. It's a huge thing. Shamanism, neo-paganism, and so on. So I think there's a lot of value here because this is sort of unexplored territory. There isn't anything in any official book right now that explores spiritualism and animism and giving this life, you know, I'm, I'm kind of reminded of, I've really been on this big Miyazaki kick lately because from a creative standpoint, that guy is a world genius to me. Miyazaki does things like this a lot. He delves into animism a lot. So it's really cool to see that you're going to take, get a stance on delving into it, but how do we now crunch it and get it into the fifth edition gameplay space? Really, really well done. So introduction to animism, we've been talking about that. What is it? It is the belief that spirits inhabit every part of the natural world. In an animistic worldview, everything has a spirit. From the grandest mountain to the lowliest rock, from the great ocean to a babbling brook, from the sun and moon to a fighter's ancestral sword. All these objects and the spirits that inhabit them are sentient, though some are more aware, alert, and intelligent than others. The most powerful might even be considered deities, yet all are worthy of respect, if not veneration. It gives you a summary of each chapter's contents. Chapter one deals with spiritual summoning. Here you will discover the four different types of spiritual entities that are presented in this book, as well as the means to encounter, summon, and interact with them. I love that, and it does provide you know, in depth, you know, some blurbs, some tables, because you're dealing with sort of newer NPCs. It isn't just how do you negotiate with dragons beyond the fact that they're just going to kill you until you're high level. How do you negotiate with orc tribes? You're dealing with entities and spirits and things that have been, haven't been explored as much. And it gives fuel for the DM as to how the PCs might interact with them in many, many different ways. Chapter two is spiritual attunement. During this chapter, you'll find all you need to know regarding the ways in which a character may become a host to a spirit's supernatural powers. Chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6 are dealing with the four different spirit types, primal, ancestral, ethereal, and outsider. Chapter 7 gets into animistic magic. After having discovered the different spirit types, this chapter deals with the magical powers of animism. Some of these spells are integral parts in dealing with previously stated concepts such as exorcism and the seal of binding, right? It, the spirit may be somewhat male, malevolent. You need to paralyze it, stop it, control it. This chapter helps you deal with that. Next chapter goes into spiritual binding. This chapter is dedicated to the concept of binding spiritual entities. Using a ritualistic method that involves the seal of binding spell, you may not only seal away a spirit in order to prevent it from causing further misdeeds, but also to exploit its power in order to create powerful magic items known as magic fetishes. There is a wealth of gameplay just within that little arc of information right there, at least to me. 
And then, of course, you're going to get into the last chapter, which is character options, where you have 13 different subclasses. From pious animus to relentless spirit hunters, these individuals' abilities derive from their manner of interaction with the spirit world. There is one such archetype for each of the various classes listed in alphabetical order. 13, so I think there's the 12 core classes in the player's handbook, plus the artificer, I'm guessing, right? I love this part where it gives you an overview of, as a dungeon master, here's what this book might give to you. You know, yes, I understand you probably have already purchased this, right, for 25 bucks, and you're hoping you're going to get some content. I'm telling you there's a lot here. But I like this little blurb because it kind of immediately points you and says, as a DM, here's what you might want to look to. Here's the things it might offer. So let's go over these two real quick, and then we'll do a very quick browse through. This book is going to provide DMs with all you need to know in order to incorporate the concept of spiritualism and the presence of spirits into your campaigns. As I just said you know, earlier in the beginning, this takes specters and wraiths and ghosts or just the concept of you know, whether you're de delving into necromancy, spirits. But it takes it so much further than what might be offered as just a stat block and a creature and a monster manual. I mean, you have a hundred and... I think it's like 158 pages here that delve into just this concept. So there's a lot here for you. By using the guidelines here, you may create spiritual entities to portray, to portray the role of NPCs, random encounters, quest givers, unexpected allies, or eminent villains. So you tell me that we're dealing with a new subclass that's not really delved into very much and previously explored. And now tell me if you might ever, as a dungeon master, have need for an NPC in your game, answer is yes. Is there any value in offering tools and trip or tips and tricks and more information for random encounters? Yes. Do you ever need quest givers? Yes. Is it fun and interesting to introduce unexpected allies to the group? Yes. What about villains? So I love that it handles sort of all of the aspects that you are going to use in your game anyway. You just didn't think you had the fuel or the tools to incorporate spirits into that. As a PC, of course, the obvious one is you've got 13 new subclasses, right? But you have new magic items, new spells, new ways of creating through the binding of those spirits, new ways of sort of creating magic items. That's something that's not delved into very much in 5th edition of magic item creation, so... Just in and of itself, and then combine with the polish, the visuals of how well it's laid out. It looks very familiar, right? You've got awesome font. I think this is like a Modesto poster font. Very official 5e content. Beautiful parchment page with a little flourish along the edges to give us a little bit of a border, draw our eyes in. The artwork, I mean, if I did a quick scroll through, I like these sort of introductory chapter splash pages. You know, there's tables where it's necessary, easily readable. I can identify things. I know what chapter I'm in. I've already been given the little overview of this is what's in chapter one. I can zip, zoom through and skip ahead. I'm looking for that those parts about the subclasses only. You know where to go. You know what value it provides to both players and dungeon masters. So here you have spiritual summoning, chapter one. Encountering your spirit, what are they? Kind of the brief overview, the primal, the ancestral, the ethereal, the outsiders. A quick sort of paragraph, two or three, giving us the introduction of what those are. How you summon them, investigation. Summoning spell and seance. Spirit talismans, interacting with spirits. Little blurbs where it kind of gives these designer notes, tips and tricks of here's some sort of, you know, away from the table things to consider and whatnot. A reverent talisman, a despicable, despicable talisman. Interacting with this spirit. I mean, even if you just pulled this and this only into your world and you already had a ghost, but you know that that ghost from a CR level is too strong, too much, but there's some meat there. There's something with that ghost that could provide value. Just read through a little bit on friendly, indifferent, hostile, and you're going to start to get some interaction points that you can pull from as a DM. And these are actual, like, tangible mechanical bits. I mean, when dealing with a friendly spirit, charisma persuasion, charisma deception checks are made with advantage. So that's an, an actual thing right there of, okay, yeah, they're friendly, but what does that mean? Well, go ahead and roll, but roll that with advantage. In contrast, when you're dealing with a hostile spirit, 
But I love the fact that it's saying you can try and deal with a hostile spirit. This is more than just roll initiative, hit it. It's hostile. No, you might be able to persuade it, to deceive it, but you're doing so with disadvantage. According to the DM's discretion, a number of successful or failed charisma checks may cause the spirit's disposition towards the summoner to actively change. You kind of start moving. It went from hostile to indifferent. How many times can you play World of Warcraft and change your faction? You know, you kill one centaur tribe and your little faction chart goes up or down with the other one. So, I mean, one page alone, you know, it, it really is the essence of what I read when I was reading that little snippet on DM's Guild of... You're not sure if you want to use this, but it definitely is dabbling and, and delving into territory that's clearly created by those that are knowledgeable about it. They've researched it. They're passionate about it. It is not offered in any other piece of content that I've seen, not to this scope and breadth, but you're not sure what you want to use, but hey, here's just a page and let's just deal with that. Spiritual attunement. How do you become a host? What are the sort of powers you might gain? Right, If it sort of possesses you or you're just interacting with this thing, what is sort of the trickle and residual effect of how that affects your character? Hosting a spirit. I like the little tables and charts, you know, because now you're dealing with almost like the way a warlock would interact with their patron, right? But you're specific to the spirit world and spirit entities. But things go bad. You need to repel it. All right, it's starting to take control of me. You know, you tell your your player... This thing is telling you to go left. I know you want to go right and the group's supposed to go right, but you're going left. All right, now we need to repel it or now we need to, okay, now we've repelled it, but we still might want to get the power that it offers, but I don't want it inside of me. So let's repel it and then now let's bind it. And then through that binding, that seal of binding type of thing, you can then start to delve into sort of magic item creation from it. Here you get into the four specific types. You have the primal. I mean, you heard me talk about the artwork. I mean, how does this right here not offer? The wheels, for me at least, are spinning. That's a beautiful piece of art. Incredible. So here's the primal. And now we're, de de you know, you're getting lore, bits of interest, information. R-O-L-E, role play stuff, but then you get actual things, like things that you'd write on your character sheet. New spells. You want to summon this primal spirit. A spellcaster that knows the appropriate spell may cast it as a ritual. In order for the spell to function, a primal must be within, it, within its range. Summon primal spirit. Check this out. It talks about... <clears throat> For a reader who is no stranger to musical theory, below follow the scores of each primal spirit's intonation. And then there's a QR code. So I'm going to take my iPhone. Check this out. I'm going to put the camera over that little QR code. Click on the little pop-up and it opens up a SoundCloud file. Come on, guys. That's such an awesome touch. Well done. I love stuff like that. I mean, you're interacting with that, incorporating technology. I mean, why not? That's so fun. You know? So you're, it's, music is worth so much at your table, right? But now you're just offering ways of getting into that. You show this picture. You know this thing is around. It's nearby. You, you summon a primal spirit and you start delving into it. Talismans ember spirit and the various host powers i mean you're dealing with again these are you know upon landing your body reverts back to its incorporeal form causing a fiery blast in a five foot radius centered on you creatures caught within either make a deck save or take 2d8 fire blah 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 look at that artwork i mean that guy looks incredible and then there you go you have like this new creature ember incarnate cr one two five seven or ten depending on where you go with it Another awesome picture, a QR code that you can scan to get more sound, more music, stat blocks, moon spirits.
And remember, we're in one of the spirit types. I mean, look how many. So, hey, I want a book of new monsters. Well, here you go. A rhyme incarnate, an ocean incarnate with cool artwork, a mountain incarnate, right? Remember, you're summoning sort of the essence or the spirits themselves. Think of, uh, if you ever played World of Warcraft, the uh, classic, before your shaman got the different totems, which is what allowed you to manifest magic and spells and like fire and protection and earth, you had to do all these different storylines and quests, but that made it really fun. It could have been tedious to some of like, I want to be able to push my button, but you had all these little quests. You had to go up in this hill and this hidden valley into this cave and talk with this, you know, fire spirit and do this quick quest. And then you unlock this, this totem. There's a lot that goes into this. You can play into maybe the rules that you might be using a house rule of you are allowed to multi-class, but you need to give me a good reason why you want to multi-class, right? Like you're a fighter. Why are you now multi multi-classing into cleric? You are a warlock. What the hell happened in your life, to, you know, in the story arc that now makes it logical that you're now going to go into druid. Maybe you started dealing and you, you met this mountain incarnate, this mountain spirit, and that's starting to deal with the animism and the shamanistic type of things. And that might provide the fuel you need. So, I mean, there's a lot there. I mean, how many am I just scrolling over? This one is beautiful. I love, I mean, look at that art. That's on par with anything in any monster manual, right? And then you continue going through and now you have ancestral. I mean, okay. Does that not scream something to you right there? If you can't pull from that, you're not opening the floodgates of your creative mind enough. Ancestral spirits. <clears throat> Same thing. All of these details. An artificer spirit. Barbarian spirit. Bard, so the 13 classes, cleric, right? These are your ancestors of your class type, monk, and it covers the range of all 13 of them. The 12 in the player's handbook plus the artificer, the rogue spirits, warlock spirits. Okay, now you have Ethereum spirits. Again, artwork is top notch. So you're almost, you know, every one of these, you're getting how many more new stat blocks, things to use, right? This is so much more than just a specter, a ghast, a ghost, and so on. Because remember, you have all these other chapters that surround these stat blocks, these physical encounter things that you might be able to bring into your game that give rhyme reason how it might interact with the group, provide something more than just a fight. It's a quest giver, it's a key NPC, it's an ally, it becomes a villain, and so on. What else do we have? Spirit of Terror. Outsiders. Oof. Like this art is very evocative. Very, very evocative art. It's it just a Rakshasa guy right there. App, oof. Come on. That sells it right there. Sign of the Great Old Ones. <laughs> <clears throat> Infernal. Vestige. That's beautiful. Now you're dealing into another chapter, spiritual binding. All right, we need to contain these things. It gives you conduits. It gives you items that you need. How do you, how, now you're starting to get into creating things, crafting these new magic item things called this, you know, known as fetishes, imbuing them, using them. Well, how many charges, intelligent levels on them. We're talking like sentient magic items at this point. Tables, charts, examples of them. I mean, magic item creation as a whole is not really explored at all in fifth edition and now i mean this content is like narrowing it down into you know the storyline of spirits but it's giving you a lot i can't tell you already how many players at my table through various campaigns have said i really want to get into like making my own stuff i mean look at one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen twenty one two three twenty five all the way from uncommon to legendary. Some are varied. The Dark Light Lantern. <clears throat> Some really cool artwork. That's beautiful for a locket. Crown of Scorn. I mean, yeah, there's not art for every single one of them, but 
where there is art. I mean, the mug of matters and the devil candle. So you're getting 25 new magic items. I mean, look at these books. Manual of the Dream Jumper, Ravidon's Vile Grimoire, Pride and Sorrow. This might be what the spark you need. Uh, I'm going to include that. And then you go backwards and start browsing through the content to figure out what spirit and how that might interact with the players and the other options that this book offers. Animistic Magic. All those spells. What list, what classes can cast them, what school they're in. Do they require concentration? Do they have any ritual aspects like exorcism? Yes. So entirely new spells. And now your character options. I mean, the Path of the Ancestral Guardian subclass. Oh, sorry, this is additional inspirations. You can find a selection of character options that can be used in relevance to the spirit world. So I like that it does that, or it kind of shows pre-existing ones, but it starts to tie those into the content that's here. But here's all the new stuff. Path of the Woad Warrior, College of the World Wakers, Dreams Domain, Circle of the Animus, Forms Adept, and so on. I mean, and it's, you know, there's the Spirit Binder. I mean, it's the full detail. Awesome artwork that might inspire you more. Extra attack, Spirit Bound Armor, Master Binder. That's incredible. Bardic College of the World Wakers. Circle of Dreams. Or it's Cleric Dreams Domain. The art is very inspiring. Like, I see that and I'm like, I'm going to play that thing. Uh, what does it do? Yeah, so, I mean... I'll put a link in the description, guys. I mean, go out there and if you're even fishing a little bit, spirits, animism, and that sort of vein, it's the best content I've seen that covers this. And combining it with the presentation of the fit, the finish, the layout, the readability, it's easy to navigate through. It's very efficient. You saw me scrolling through it. It's only 25 bucks. Yes, I know that's full price of a D&D &D book, but you're getting it in PDF format. You can look at it as you need on your screen. It has almost 200 pages, 160 pages or so. So it's full content. But what, 20 something new spells, 13 entirely new sub. I mean, that's something like Xanathar's gives you, right? 13, well, maybe not, but you get it. 13 new subclasses, magic item creation. But most importantly, you're delving into something that is not covered elsewhere. But it's giving you little pieces that's keeping it world free so you can plug and play it into any world. And you can also only pull and use the primal spirits and nothing else and get some content and value out of that. You can only pull if you want to the magic spells or the new magic item creation. I only want to use the barbarian subclass. You know, like I like that it's presented in that way where it's easily navigatable. So... Take a look at it, and once again, my friend, thank you so much. I am honored that you sent this to me. Well done. I'll see you guys soon.